I'm Lewis Wirtz. I am the uh, communications director at the Western Landowners Alliance now. Um, pre immediately previous to that, I was communications director with Eco Agriculture Partners. Um, that was five years ago now. Um, it's crazy. Time flies. Um, and uh, so, uh, and I will tell you a little bit. So I live in Denver, Colorado. Um, started when I started at EcoAg, we lived in Washington, D.C., but I moved here before I left. I was working for EcoAg for two years from Denver. Um, and personally, I have, I was mentioning to Seth, I have a seven-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son um, and a couple of dogs who you might hear uh, barking in the background who are still around. The seven-year-old and the two-year-old are away at school and daycare right now. So um, yeah, that's me. I can, um, I have a, a slideshow, but uh, that I will, that it's like not working as I presented in Chrome. Um, so I'm just gonna present it in the non-presenter mode and you can look ahead a little bit. Um, and there's a video here, I'll send this to you all um, so you can like watch the video and then there's some links to things in it too. Um, that might be helpful reference for later. Um, if you're interested, Western Landowners Alliance, um, I'm actually not even sure it'll work to play this, so I'm not going to try. Um, if this is a video about us, um, it's also on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, but we were founded in 2012 and by uh, a group of landowners who, um, in the basically in the Rocky Mountain um, region of the United States, and what prompted it was a, uh, a series of conversations between some uh, some of the very largest landowners in the U.S., um, very some of the very largest landowners in the world, if you don't count institutional landowners like the Catholic Church or um, governments, um, Ted Turner uh, and a guy named John Malone and his ranch managers um, were being approached by a uh, some uh, group called, um, oh gosh, what am I think? What is I'm dropping the name now? Um, but the, um, the group was working on trying to connect, build a corridor, a wildlife corridor of protected lands uh, through like basically on, uh, there's a book called The Spine of the Continent um, that talks about this principle. So the idea being that like North America from Panama to the Yukon um, has these uh, has has had wildlife connectivity and wildlife movement um, along that the center through the center of the continent for millennia uh, eons and that if we didn't act to protect those landscapes in some meaningful way that the that it would be fragmented beyond. Um, uh, the health of at least of the, we would have islands of biodiversity that would slowly be collapsing like we do all over, like we see all over the world, right? So that there was this movement here um, coming from the conservation biology movement. And they talked to these private landowners, they looked at the map and they saw, oh, Yellowstone is like 2 million acres of land protected here. And then we've got Grand Canyon National Park and uh, all of these, you know, and then some federal wilderness areas in the US and some large uh, federal or tribal protected areas in Canada. Um, uh, and then some uh, designated areas of, of wilderness protection or, or nature protection in Mexico and in other parts of this corridor. Well, what's the land in between them? Um, and it's owned by people, by, 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 by individuals. The way that the West was settled was um, uh, that that happened. And then um, some of those, some of that land has been acquired over time by people like Ted Turner into tens of, or two and a half million acres worth of land that Ted Turner owns in this corridor, basically. So as, a, as one of those people, um, these conservation biologists were talking to him and his ranch management staff. And they started, to, they convened a, a bunch of people at Vermejo Park Ranch, which is a 500,000 acre parcel of land on the Colorado, New Mexico border um, in 2012. Um, and this is more than we sh generally share about the uh, history of, of ecoag but or of, of wla but you can understand that like i'm i'm talking with you 
with you all to sort of give you the context of like how we have to talk about these issues in the U in the Western U.S. Um, and the sort of some of the barriers to um, uh, engagement on conservation issues that are cultural and socioeconomic that uh, the Western Landowners Alliance is working within in the in in the Western United States. And I'll get to that context in a second. Um, uh, in, in more detail, but the, um, and so then, so then it emerged that like, oh, a lot of people who, who came to this, to these initial convenings, like they had what they, what they started to call like the nickels, dimes and quarters, um, of the, like on the map that they had printed like a room size, a wall size map of the, of this area. And like, oh, my ranch is about the size of a nickel on a U.S. nickel on this, which is five cents and we shouldn't even mint those anymore. But, um, uh, <laughs> on the uh on the map and then oh i've got a quarter up here you know in, in montana i own you know this this big chunk of land and and actually between all of these places like maybe maybe it adds up to actually a significant sum of land and if we could if we could ensure that this that these private lands were performing the same ecosystem services and providing the same habitat value that we hope that our private our our public protected areas are, then we would actually be closer to having this corridor protected than we thought we were. Um, and, and some of those places are in legally binding conservation easement agreements that do say like we are going to forever protect this land for its conservation value. And some of them aren't, but the, their owners um, are practicing the kinds of habitat restoration and, and stewardship uh, practices we would hope everyone would. And, and the idea was to grow that movement of people who were willing to contribute their own private stewardship to this model of let's protect the biodiversity of the West. So that's how it, that's how it initiated. And then, you know, you think about what the threats are to those private lands in between these, these, these federal lands, these protected areas, and some of them are state protected areas also, um, because we have this federal system in the U S so you are familiar. Um, and, uh, the the context of that um, in in the Western U.S. is that we have this public land private land matrix. About fifty percent of if you take the eleven Western United States, not including Alaska, which is largely uh, public, <laughs> um, skews and huge and skews the skews the numbers dramatically. Take the eleven Western United States. About fifty percent on average is owned by the federal government. And then there's state lands as well. In Colorado, so like further east you go, the states have more private land. And then you have like a uh, Utah and Nevada, Idaho, parts of the country that were settled last. They have a lot of, of federal land. Nevada is almost 90% federally owned. So, um, so that means that the, you know, the, the, and Tom uh, is on the call and making me a little nervous because he knows this very well as uh, coming from the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Oregon and working on the RCPP program, which deals with this interface all the time between public land management and private managers who rely on the, uh, those public lands for a lot of different things and are trying to accomplish stewardship goals um, on those things. So that, that matrix means that people are... Um, owning private land that that is and and there's also a really interesting thing that happened with settlement in the west that is they um that we have this checkerboarding where because of the way the railroads were developed and how we decided we would finance that we basically gave the railroad we, we divided up all of this federal land into squares set 640 acres initially and then 160 acre squares and said you can sell a parcel and then the federal government gets a parcel. You can sell, the, and the, the railroads were given the parcels to sell in order to finance the construction of the railroads. And so you have these this really weird matrix in a lot of places, especially in the plains in the eastern part of the West, um, that where a ranch is made up of equal parts, public land and private land, there are no fences. There's no way to see that on, on, on the ground when you were there. You could be standing on a public land parcel one minute, take three steps, and suddenly you're on on private land. The rancher knows that that's uh, that they expect. They basically manage that whole part, that whole area, as if it was their land, despite having this public private separation. Because we need them <laughs> to manage it that way, they just have to pay a lease rate 
for the parts of the of the thing to the to the federal or state in some cases state owners owners um, for use of the forage and and for those reasons it makes it actually really complicated to tease out how should people use land can we change the way that public land is used um, without dramatically affecting the way that people have to manage their private land and vice versa so um, that that especially complicates things in in the western U.S. I mean, and the other thing that's going on in, in the Western US going on around the world um, to um, maybe a lesser extent is this dramatic rural urban divide, maybe a slightly lesser extent, some places actually even more, which is kind of scary because less than 2% of Americans are involved in agriculture in any way, not just like literally working on farm, but like working in agricultural adjacent businesses. Um, so like slaughterhouses or like, like that's a crazy small number of people who are involved in the growing of our food. Um, and, and so that's like, a, there's a huge disconnect between like what's happening on these lands with these this big, big public private matrix and what people are doing and how I eat. Um, and then, uh, only 14% of the U S population is living, was living in rural areas, according to last census, which, so that's like, you can see that there's a lot of people who live in rural areas who aren't involved in agriculture at all. Um, and in some, like in some way involved in economically, I suppose is one way to think about it, but obviously they are involved. They drop, they live there, they drive by, they are, they are direct stakeholders and whether the agriculture is managed well or not in terms of like it affects dramatically their daily lives and the communities that they live in. But that's also a, a very small fraction of Americans, right? So um, in the, in, when we are talking to people about like how to take care of these places and why we should take care of them, we're, we're, you know, pitching up a hill here where are people who are very disconnected from what these communities are actually like and uh, what they need um, and what what agriculture looks like when you actually have to do it. Um, and then at the same time, that 86% of people who, who live in cities and a lot of the people who live in rural areas have really large expectations about what those rural areas should do for them, like how what, what they expect. Um, from them. We, we had a, uh, the pandemic pushed people in record numbers into the outdoors to recreate because they couldn't go to the theater or to, you know, all these other places that they were used to entertaining themselves in. So they went outside and they got used to it. And now they're like, oh, I actually really like it out here. And I'm going to go out there all the time. And I bought a mountain bike and I better go use it. And, um, and so there's just a lot of people who rely now on these places, have expectations about how they should be managed for their own enjoyment that don't live or work there. Um, a lot more than there have been and that continues to grow. And then there's also this expectation that these landscapes provide increasing amounts of habitat, not, not just like the same habitat that they've been providing before, but we did, the, when the West was settled in the United States, we, we um, exterminated uh, wolves and grizzly bears. Um, and also a large, um, less, less dramatically in the public eye, but like also coyotes, mountain lions, most of the large carnivores of the West saw huge population collapses uh, in the early 20th century. Um, they were hunted and trapped and poisoned to near extinction in the lower 48. They fortunately, because North America is a very large continent, they had refuge in Canada. Um, and in the case of Mexican gray wolves in Mexico, um, in the case of jaguars in Mexico, but like lots of these, there's a, there's a, there's a large gap in the um, historical range of grizzly bears, wolves, um, and then cougars and mountain lions are different examples because they've made dramatic without much human assistance, um, other than banning commercial hunting and the trapping and poisoning of them. They've made mat dramatic rebounds. Um, on their own. But grizzly wolves and grizzly bears have different biology and they've needed a lot more support to recover their populations in the lower 48. And also they, because of their biology, they are much more challenging for humans to live around. Um, they wolves hunt in packs, they are social and they teach their young behaviors, um, all like uh, that spread widely. Um, uh, and rapidly. And then they, um, so they learn to eat cows as a, for instance, or sheep, um, very quickly. If they have, if there's a, pre, uh, if there's like a, a natural food source decline in an area and they find easy livestock prey, uh, they will quickly become livestock preferential 
predators. Um, and then grizzly bears are scary. Like there was just a, a hunter <laughs> mauled to near death. Um, for, un, unfortunately, fortunately, his hunting, he was part, hunting with a partner and the partner was it had a was carrying a firearm it's archery season in the west right now you're not allowed to hunt with firearms um in most of the west currently or at least for elk and other big game species but the partner was carrying a firearm and shot and killed this grizzly bear before it could kill his hunting partner um he had to be airlifted to a near near nearby hospital um so uh male grizzly bears especially in the fall at the time that most people want to be hunting out outside and that hunting seasons are are um scary, scary creatures, they will attack and kill you. Um, <laughs> if you are near what they, um, near elk, near their food source. So, um, so people are scared about them, about their populations recovering. At the same time, a lot of people live in, who live in cities don't ever encounter these creatures. They don't hunt. They don't like the number of people who, who, um, hunt for recreation or food in the United States has consistently has declined precipitously in the last hundred years. Um, and so now they want them to be back there. Um, and they also don't manage livestock or expect that. Um, and so they expect that, uh, we share these landscapes with these creatures. Um, and that's, that's like explicitly happening, like not just like that it happened naturally, but in Colorado in 2022, we reintroduced or 2023, we reintroduced gray wolves. So they were brought here from Oregon, um, the population had been moving, popu wolves had been naturally migrating from Wyoming where they can be hunted. And there's a population of more than a thousand wolves um, into Colorado, but they were having a hard time getting established in the central part of the state. There's a big highway that runs right, right through it, Highway 70, kind of, and a bunch of people who live there. So they brought wolves in from Oregon um, and that is going about as well as you could expect in a pot in a state in the in the west one of the west more populous states um it's challenging and then in washington in 2026 there's now a federal project to reintroduce grizzly bears into the north cascades which is the national park um that will that ideally provides habitat connectivity between the populations in northern idaho and populations of of grizzly bears that have existed for a long time in british columbia um and uh the coastal grizzly bears so um but that but that obviously that population connectivity requires that those bears that they put in north cascades national park have babies and those babies move out of the park and onto private land so we have to work with these within these contexts right and then we also are expecting these lands to provide carbon sequestration and, and climate change resilience and that takes the form of wildfire mitigation right we have like dramatic wildfires in california and other parts of the west that are burning suburb, su suburbs um and we so we're asking farmers and ranchers and people who live in rural communities to manage forests and landscapes so that they don't do that but then these landscapes evolve with fire there's lots of things going on there and then there's also water they took down there's there's dam removal there's lots of expectations about how we manage these landscapes that may or may not be compatible with um, agriculture and, and the economic viability of, of rural communities. Um, at the same time, in 20, with the Biden administration in 2020, there was, they announced something called Amer the America the Beautiful Initiative, which was 30 by 30 translated into uh, American English. <laughs> um, so if you're familiar with the 30 by 30 initiative, it's protecting 30% of the land and water of the planet uh, by 2030. Um, that's, uh, pro I, you're pro you're probably all familiar with the, 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 um, problematic nature of, uh, counting legal protection in the ways that it initially was, um, initially and continues to be in sort of formally counted. Um, and all, there's all kinds of issues with, with having those kinds of metrics, but the, the big goal is a is a sort of is long term as a half earth goal 50% sort of eo wilson initiated idea of 50% of the earth set aside for biodiversity by 2050 30 by 30 gets us some of the way there in the us like there the biden administration put forward this america the beautiful initiative and put a bunch of resources into doing that one of the ways that we worked really hard with a coalition of organizations 
to shape that when they announced it during the transition, then they announced that they were going to be doing something like that during the transition was to, to focus on the collaborative conservation pieces of it. So in other words, the community led um, uh, and um, really uh, basically integrated landscape management approaches to how do we do conservation? How do we, how do we talk about protected lands in ways that are um, palatable to the people who live in and around them in ways that are going to be compatible with healthy human communities in those areas, as well as um, healthy biodiversity. And that was really a kind of a moment in um, our national conversation, um, I think, uh, where we had to um, ask some significant questions about the history of conservation in, in the United States and what it was going to look like going forward. So when the wet, when Western Landowners Alliance talks about conservation, we um, we put out graphics like this <laughs> and say the future of conservation is collaborative, and then we we have this um, a whole bunch of models for how that happens in the West that we can point policymakers to that we talk to um, that we help communities get started. And a lot of this comes right out of um, or feels really at home with my work at Ecoag. So I was thrilled to just to like learn about this organization when I was um, looking for work that would be that would keep me closer to home um, as I uh, as I was raising kids because I wanted to work for an organization that was committed to this kind of approach, the kind of approach that EcoAg embodies, the integrated landscape management approach, a community-led conservation approach that sees humans as an integral part of healthy natural communities. I wanted to, I was, I was thrilled to find that an organization that was called the Western Landowners Alliance that was dedicated not to working on public lands management, but to working with private landowners, with farmers and ranchers on these concepts it existed and was, um, and was thinking about it from a very strategic perspective. I think the unique thing is there are, some, there are a lot of organizations that um, or not a lot, but there are some organizations that work um, with farmers and ranchers on um, agroecology or, or eco-agriculture, biodiversity friendly farming and ranching practices. Um, from an individual farmer ranch practice change perspective from, you know, so like, let's teach them how to do um, uh, regenerative ranching or um, organic farming or whatever. And then there's also a lot of organizations that are working on landscape scale conservation. There's this, the, an organization called the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. There's, there's been for a long time an organization called the Yellowstone to Yukon Initiative. Um, and they take a kind of like, let's look at the map, similar to how Western Landowners Alliance was founded. Let's look at the map and let's figure out how we implement conservation so that it connects these corridors. But um, not a lot of organizations, I think, that are working the way that um, you all are working internationally and we can have it. I would really like to have a conversation about how we could do this together in the U.S. better. Um, on the economic drivers of, um, like, of community stewardship. So, what is what are what are the real barriers to for people to work together to grow businesses that are compatible, agriculture, food production, natural resource dependent businesses that are compatible with biodiversity, with healthy biodiversity and support healthy human communities. And that's the part that is really exciting for me about how we've approached things. And then the language that we use to talk about that has to be, uh, um, we use a term um, that was coined by the Malpai Borderlands Group um, uh, in um which is down in Arizona on the borderlands with Mexico. Um, yeah, called the, and, and a man named Courtney White, who founded an organization called the Covira Coalition um, that's called, that is uh, 
called the Radical Center. And in, in U.S. politics, we have a left and a right. Most a lot of countries have this similar a similar divide. Pol political groups uh, fall on these spectrums. In the U.S., it's especially uh, challenging these days, as many of you know, because we have a two we have a two party system and a non parliamentary democracy with a electoral college, and it just means that like the divide gets seems worse and worse. But actually, a lot of the things, especially related to land management, are a, a big common ground area. But you have to use the right language um, because in a lot of rural communities, their experience with conservation or conservation organizations or nature protection has meant exclusion, um, has meant uh, dying communities, uh, leave industries that are collapsing. So no jobs, their children want move to cities and don't come back to visit them, let alone, let alone to live there. Um, and so, and this is, a, I mean, it, I'm not saying anything that's specific, like super unique to, to the United States, but this challenge of that combined with the way our political discourse goes means that it's really important to, um, to us, if we want to work with private landowners who care deeply about the quality of the landscapes that they live in and that they steward, but aren't, don't think of themselves as environmentalists um, or would be afraid that somebody would call them an environmentalist uh, if they pulled, you know, when they came in the door of the local saloon um, after, at the end of a long day of harvesting, because no one would talk to them, <laughs> then they'd have to sit in the corner by themselves. They, you, you have to use different language, right? So um, but, but I also think that there's, there's an encouraging sign and I'll talk about some examples in just a second. I know I'm over time already, um, that, uh, um, of people changing the way that those, la that language is using and slowly introducing terms that are more familiar to the international conversation and the internet. And, and so here's an example, an, an old example, and I'm going to do these in sort of, um, age order, uh, well, lower resources. This is Tom's probably very familiar with this group. Um, in Willowa County, Oregon, we have a mandate right now, which is very exciting to work on with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to help them uh, reach um, ranchers in particular um, to because they're having a really hard time managing wolves, uh, wolf conflict in, in this part of Oregon, in Northeast Oregon. Um, but Willowa Resources has been working on forest and agriculture issues, forest management, timber, and agriculture issues in this county you know, um, in Northeast Oregon for 30 years now, and really thinking holistically about how industry, uh, uh, agriculture, and uh, the all of the other resource tourism, all of those things fit together to, to create a community that can retain its rural character, but be a place where pe that people want to live um, and, and have, and, and they've used some really, um, interesting and creative language as the political winds have changed to leverage federal resources about job creation, about co conservation, depending on what you're doing. That the nice thing about the radical center is that because, um, if, if you end the integrated landscape approach is that if you, if you look at these landscapes in this way, you can appeal to somebody who says that their priority is American jobs and uh, economic growth and a political a politician who says that their priority is conservation and climate change uh, mitigation because the, the outcomes are both, both and, right? We should be able to manage healthy forests, create industries that uh, reduce wildfire and provide local jobs and uh, valuable American-made products. and um, uh, like all, all of those things are possible in these, in these communities and Willow Resources have been doing that in, in incredibly creative and interesting ways for 30 years. Um, right after I got invited to do this brown bag, I, um, had a conversation with this man, Bill Milton, who actually, he actually sent me an email and he said, I see in your bio that it says something about eco agriculture. What, it, what is that? Can we talk about that? Like, I want to know why that's in your bio and you work for Western Landowners Alliance. <laughs> so that was interesting. Bill is a, a rancher. He went to, uh, you can see on his sweatshirt that he went to the University of California 
Um, but he grew up in Montana. He has a family ranch. He's the fourth generation manager of his family ranch in Winnet. Petroleum County, Montana is the, in the 2010 census was the seventh least populous county in the United States. There are, there were 500 and some odd people who lived there. Um, uh, but when it, the, uh, the ACEs group that Bill helped found when he got back to manage his family ranch, this, they, they were tech formally founded, I think in 2016, they are just doing some of the most creative. The reason Bill reached out is because he is, is trying to be as plugged in as possible to everything that's going on about, and he's in his words, saving the planet happening all over the world. And he had, he knew enough about agroecology and enough about um, landscape, the landscape approach to wonder why I was working for WLA and interested in then coming from this background. So we had a long conversation about that. When it is has just an, just decided they they've been doing a lot of uh, collaborative conservation um, there in the sense of um, uh, working with people to plan conservation easement acquisitions um, on critical ranches so that those ranches can stay will stay in agriculture rather than be bought by out of state recreation owners and taken out of agricultural production. They want people who are growing up in that community to be able to have an agricultural business, um, and one of the big threats to that is people who buy the land. With the, with the intent of basically just uh, being there for fall hunting season and then otherwise not, not using it um, because it's so remote, it's great elk hunting, um, but uh, that is, you know, the, the land can degrade to a point where it's not really suitable for livestock production if, if that's the management approach. But of course, hunting and livestock production, active livestock production are not incompatible at all. If you have, if the land is affordable for people who want to raise cattle on it and they can offer hunting opportunities um, and elk and provide lots of elk habitat. Um, and then just recently when it launched a, um, a, a self-funded crowdfunded, there's a little bit of federal grants, a little bit of state grants that they've cobbled together to build their own revolving fund. So like they basically, Petroleum County is so rural and r remote that they have, there's no, there's no bank anymore. <laughs> there's no, you know, it's, um, when it is the county seat, the county seat, and there's only a couple hundred people who live there technically. Um, and, but they have now, a they've founded their own, this community group has founded its own um, economic development co-op. So, the, the energy in these in rural communities around finding solutions that that marry economic development and environmental conservation is really pretty exciting. Um, and Bill is a great example. And then, um, and you guys all know uh, also that like a lot of the time, it takes a specific kind of threat to get a to get a landscape initiative started. So like there's something that's that triggers it. It's a hurricane and the flooding that follows and or wildfire or, or the threat of somebody of, of a business leaving or the bit or a business closing down and going away and then and, and the economic fallout that happens or or in this case in the Rocky Mountain front, um, the fact that there's just there are grizzly bears in town now. Um, the populate this this place is about 150 miles east. Uh, southeast of Glacier National Park, where grizzly bears were uh, intentionally reintroduced um, in the 90s and uh, and have been federally protected. So you can't, there's no hunting of grizzly bears um, and their populations have expanded, which is great news. It's a conservation success story, but the, these folks have been ranching in for generations in this landscape, ranching and farming um, without grizzly bears on the landscape for 100 and 20 years now. And now they have grizzly bears in their yards and grain bins and uh, calving pens. And so we helped them start a collaborative group um, back to this uh, document here, this place-based collaboration for conflict reduction guide is um, uh, basically about how to start a group that will bring people together to talk in a landscape management approach strategy with, with that at that level of uh and and with those strategies in mind to specifically address large carnivore conflict 
So this group just started in technically in 2021, um, but really they've been working like actively 2022, 2023. Uh, and then this year um, we helped them secure some federal resources of a national fish and wildlife F foundation grant um, to have a full-time coordinator, which is super exciting in this community. Um, and that's another way that like to sort of wrap up here, WLA's role in all of this is to tell the stories of these things. That's, that's my job. And then also we provide a lot of, we provide direct support in um, enabling through collaborative grant proposals westwide or statewide, like large scale grant proposals that are meant to move money down to that, that coordinator level to like basically provide the staff resources and the capacity for these groups to be actively planning, talking to each other, looking for other financial resources, developing the kind of thing that when it just, just put out, that only happens because that group had a full-time coordinator in that town. And those are also really, if you think about it, just also really good jobs in conservation and economic development based in rural communities that, that, that emerge from this practice of um, thinking at this scale and involving community members in um, collaborative conservation. So that's how, that's one of the ways the WLA is involved. And then um, and I think it, it works west wide and we've involved in all of those groups in various different ways. Um, and yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you, Lewis. That was fabulous. And I, I wrote down a few questions because I think you gave an overview of a lot of different things, but I'm sure some people have some nitty gritty questions that they want to prod you about. Um, does anyone have a question <laughs> that they'd like to start with? Um, yeah, go ahead, Tom. People, maybe Louis, some people raise their hands and just want to call on them. That might be the sure. easiest. Yeah, yeah no. but, hey, Louis, that's great. Did we ever meet when I was with RCPP? I think that, I think we did briefly, maybe. Possible, yeah. I, it yeah. was a while ago now, though, but yeah. Yeah, but but I know uh, that um, I worked a little bit with Western Land as a, uh, Landowners Association with the RCPP project that worked. Yeah, looking at grizzly or you know, predator conflict across multiple states, uh, be interested to hear how that's working out. But um, yeah. in general, it's it's nice to make the connection. One of the things as director of 1000 Landscapes is uh, I'd like to think about uh, a U.S. strategy for 1000 Landscapes and how to take that ILM concept into into the U.S. It's a different, you know, we're focused mm -hmm. on an international kind of audience and we use language that uh that that may or may not resonate but it would be nice to think about how to how to develop that kind of strategy to work in 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 the western states i know that there's you know there's all sorts of things going on in kind of lance you know kind of that are like ilm the you know it, it, the western states are very public land oriented so the the public agencies have some sort of version of ilm adaptive management but it's just yeah. within their their land uh bases they're not necessarily working within a partnership setting you have uh, the conservation world, which brings in these concepts like habitat connectivity, which doesn't really resonate with the local landowners, uh, that that concept so much. Yeah. And then you have programs like RCPP that are, you know, projectified, um, you know, partnerships. It's not really focused on long term um, building of a, of a landscape partnership. So I think there's there's pieces out there going on in, yeah. in the Western states, but it's not. Um, I, I think it would it would be interesting to work with you and, and think through a strategy to kind of pull that pull some of those pieces together into an ILM approach in, in yeah. the Western States. So it would be interesting to think about. And um, I, I know that uh, uh, Pheasants, I saw that Michael Brown's on the call too, is, is also thinking similar things as well. So yeah, no, just, yeah. I, th I think some energy could could develop around that. Yeah, we so it's it, it's great that uh, I didn't really I didn't know uh, where Michael Brown was coming from, but uh, specific to the pheasants thing, I mean, we are another example that we're very directly involved with that um, is close to what's what's happening here is there's a a lesser prairie chickens landowners lesser prairie chicken landowners alliance forming in northeast New Mexico, Panhandle, Oklahoma. Tech Panhandle of Texas, Lesser Prairie. There's a, there's an endangered bird in the U.S. called the Lesser Prairie Chicken um, that um, uh, requires uh, well-managed grassland habitat. Grasslands are among our most endangered 
uh, ecosystem type because of because most of them have been converted into crop agriculture in the U.S. Um, so healthy native prairie um, is uh, basically the viability of healthy native prairie um, and its active stewardship depends on viable livestock operations in that region of the U.S. And we're working closely with a group of ranchers, a consortium, a, a, collabor a collaborative conservation group to, to develop strategies for protecting that landscape and then also economic ecosystem service market approaches that might help support activity there. So there's a lot of I've had a lot of conversations with people there about how we could, you know, we talk about stacking functions. Anyway, that's just a good way in uh, right. among other among others. Yeah, there's there's lots of there's lots of opportunities, um, and I'd love to have that conversation. So yeah, yeah, let's do yeah it. we should we should touch base again sometime. Yeah, and then the RCPP update is that we are having a oh, as you might imagine, a devil of a time uh, find yeah. getting 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 final signed agreements. But um, yeah. we I know, I know what that's like. The <laughs> but the the work we we got these large regional conservation partnership uh, program uh, awards to do uh, conflict reduction carnivore conflict reduction in Oregon. Um, Montana, Idaho, Montana, Idaho, and then Colorado. New Mexico, Arizona, gray wolf, uh, or Mexican gray wolf habitat. I can't, I'm, um, and, uh, and they dovetail nicely with other work that we're doing. And, um, and then it, meanwhile, it will enable a lot of people to get practices, ideally, uh, to get practices on the ground for conflict reduction that also benefit landscapes in all kinds of other neat ways. So, um, yeah. that would, that's a really innovative program that I thought you developed. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm well done. We're hopeful it's, um, and people are really excited about it. So, uh, Mike. Thanks, Louis. Uh, great to hear uh, you talk about this and to uh, see you again and all, all that. And uh, very, very, uh, very interesting to hear this in the Western context. So uh, two questions, feel free to answer both or one or whatever. One is, what have you all, what kind of uh, specific incentives have you all found that you either offer or don't offer, but think it would probably work <laughs> um, to get like landowners who, you know, obviously you're probably, there's a certain group you're never going to reach, but like ones who might be inclined to hear your message, what 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 type of carrots are out there that you feel are could yeah. have been have proven useful or could be useful? That's number one. Number two is, I guess it's kind of an extension of that is that what what language, what kinds of language have you arrived at that you think resonates with that those people? You know, I mean, the, not the not the people in the choir, not the people who want to pick up yeah. on your yeah. jargon but also not the people who are never going to hear you. Like what language works for the winnables, the swing staters? Yeah. Um, you know, we really focus on, talk, we, we talk a lot about economic viability of working lands. So, um, and then sometimes we, when we're talking to urban audiences, we clarify that working lands means farms and ranches primarily, but also forests and people know that they're out there, that they're, producing and the economic viability argument goes to like the the big threat in a lot of the west not all of the west but a lot of the west um to the most biodiversity rich um private lands is conversion to um like subdivision so and and the thing that's driving that most farmers and ranchers are not it are not they don't want to see uh, tiny little boxes on the hillside. <laughs> they, um, they, that's a reference to a Woody Guthrie song um, that no, probably nobody got. <laughs> but it's, um, they, they aren't interested in growing houses. They, they much rather grow food and wildlife. And um, and so, but the challenge is that the the value of that land to a, a real estate developer to put um, subdivision with a grocery with the you know commercial parking lots and lots of pavement um, is much higher than it is to to pass it on or to keep it in agriculture 
And so we talk about economic viability in the sense of like um, stacking enterprises is another way to put it. People in agriculture who are not, who are um, thinking about the future of their um, property are interested in ways that they can get paid for things that they produce that they don't currently get paid for or um, uh, um, yeah, economic opportunity that um, is compatible with the rural, with, with the rural lifestyle, um, are, are ways we talk about it. So, um, the ways we've actually, we've tried to actualize that over the past little bit is that there's a program, um, there's, there, uh, so the U S department of agriculture has a lot of concert, a lot of conservation programs in the 2018 farm bill. We helped adjust the grasslands conservation reserve program to include to to provide to, to make it so that grassland that qual qualified if it was at risk of conversion not just to cropland which had been the initial function of that was to protect grassland from conversion to cropland but it also could get listed if it was at risk of con if it provided biodiversity benefits so like those there's not a lot of risk of conversion of crop uh, to, to cropland in for the grasslands of New northern new mexico because there's no water there, <laughs> um, but uh, no lack of stewardship or energy development, um, and they also provide really valuable pronghorn and lesser prairie chicken habitats. So those those pe people can enroll in that program now. Um, and we talk about habitat leasing, which is another um, way of framing that, which is how we frame the grassland CRP um, program. Um, is as a 10, 10 to 15 year contract with the government to that allows you to continue raising livestock and continue haying with within certain parameters. So you can't just like drive your tractor, your hay cutter over ground nesting birds. You have to wait until they're done with that. But like, you know, in, in various management plan protocols, but that allows people to stack functions, right? So then they can still raise a crop of, of calves or yearlings or whatever it is, cattle, sheep, and I get paid for providing the grassland habitat. Um, and so those are, those are some ways that we've done that. And then we also talk, we, another um, way we talk about this is in the context of the Endangered Species Act, which um, uh, tweaks tweak a lot of people in uh, rural America because it has meant that it seems to, it, it is designed to prevent economic activity that is dangerous to, to endangered species. The, um, and sometimes it gets weaponized against um, ranchers on, uh, who use public lands um, as a way of driving livestock production off of those lands, which has the knock-on effect of driving the, ran the private ranch land that forms the core of that pu public lands grazing operation into development like in, they get sold out of agriculture. We are working a lot on helping people get right. What we call, what are called regulatory assurances for, um, so you can, because you're not driving species decline, um, species are declining for lots of reasons. Like your operation doesn't, isn't going to be, um, vulnerable, uh, should a species be listed as endangered, you won't be forced out of business basically. Um, and so that's popular with people because it gives them a sense of assurance that um, I'm not going to be penalized for providing the habitat that other people aren't <laughs> um, just because I'm the only one who's left here. <laughs> it's kind of how it shakes out in a lot of um, uh, for in some in some cases with, with species. Seth. And so it's, it sounds like the the to pretty large extent the both the questions about the incentives and about messaging it comes down to money as, as would be kind of expected yeah. uh, but to a lesser extent it also sounds like you lean a little bit on um sort of i mean it's a weird way to say it but like identity politics that yeah there's so there's identity politics is something we actually we i think we we try to um avoid the um the trigger words of identity politics in turn like around um like in in it so we, we actually published a document that's like specific to con like carnivore conflict reduction that um is a messaging guide for groups working on that 
Um, and you can kind of, you can get a sense of the broader picture of how we approach messaging, but a lot of it is about avoiding terms that have been, um, like it even recommends avoiding the term coexistence because for a lot of people in rural America, the, you know, your coexist bumper sticker on your Subaru is like a dead giveaway that you're from out of, uh, um, you've come here to save them. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so those kinds of, the, the words go both ways in, 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 those, in, those, in those things. And so we do we kind of studiously avoid them. I, um, I'm not great at that. I grew up in San Francisco. I don't drive a Subaru, but I drive a Toyota. Um, and, uh, and, and so I like, uh, these are the weird markers of, uh, of culture in, in the West. At the same time, people are very um, interested in things that resonate really strongly with collaborative conservation from a personal point of view. Neighboring, the idea of neighboring in the rural West is super valuable, super important. It's functionally like critical to the success of an ILM, of an integrated landscape initiative is the idea of neighboring. Like we're all in this together. Like we have to be able to provide help to each other. Um, we can't like, uh, that's, that's the, that's, people are very, are familiar and, and maybe in the urban West, even like more familiar with the con with this Western concept of rugged individualism and sort of idealize the cowboy who's out there on his own. A lot of people who actually live in these communities know that the counter, the, uh, the flip side of that, that's just as, just as important as your own toughness, individual toughness is that you have to be able to count on your neighbors. So we, we talk a lot about that as a, um, as central to, um, you know, motivating people to get involved. Actually, I'm working on our magazine on our vol volume nine of our magazine. And, the, um, right now it'll come out next week, two weeks from now. And in, in print, we have a regular, um, online version, but the, the print version will mail. I'm happy to send some to anyone who wants them actually. So if you have your, want to send me your address afterwards or send Brie, your addresses and I can um, send you copies. Um, the it's it's about community stewardship. So that but we we talked about stewardship beyond boundaries, and then talk and then focused on community stewards. And the idea being that people are not just stewarding their they're not just dedicated to stewarding their like the land and the wildlife, but to each other, to the fabric of their communities. And that that that. Um, is about economics. It's about a future for those places. It's also about like there being enough people in these towns to have like mo like more than one child per grade level in the local school, <laughs> um, a hospital, um, you know, that, that can be, you know, the, those sorts of resources are critical to the future of these communities. And then therefore, in our view, and in the view of the people who live there, critical to the future of the habitat value and the, um, the active stewardship and management of these landscapes. If you think about Petroleum County as a, for instance, there's a, the population density of Petroleum County now is actually less than it was pre-European settlement. Like there, that, that place supported more humans uh, when it was <laughs> before white people showed up and there were grizzly bears and there were bison and there were all of the whole thing, right? So um, and, and the people who live there now, they look out at this landscape and they, they recognize that this place is, a, is a, um, is an, an amazing place to live and it could support so many people in, a, in, in like, if we did it, if we did it smartly and they, so, so you're not talking to them about like abstract, um, uh, things when you talk about like, you know, working together for the future of these places. And that's kind of the language that we use um, and it motivates people and it's not red or blue. Okay, I just wanted to jump in. Thank you, Lewis. Um, we have two minutes left. Uh, Seth, I know you and Lewis, it's been a while. So maybe you do want to ask this question, but I do think if anyone needs to jump off, you, you totally should. Um, and yeah, or maybe Seth, you don't want to ask your question, but I think you should. Okay, well, I can I can ask and then we can talk about it later. I actually had two questions, but I'll only ask one of them right now. It, and it's just to say, um, Lewis, we're doing some work now on um, connecting kind of in, indigenous territories or indigenous led landscape management um, and 
in finance, but also generally to what you haven't talked much about that. I mean, to what extent um, are you do you all work with indigenous groups or are they part yeah. of these collaboratives? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we uh, it's something we strive to do more of. I will say, like, we're not where we want to be in terms of engaging um, uh, in, in uh, tribal nations, both like the tr tribal sovereigns in the United States own or or have are entrusted, uh, uh, manage a lot of federal trust land. But then there's also a lot of indigenous people because of a long and complicated history who own land privately um, that they manage in agriculture and in rural communities tends to be very rural. Um, we, we, ha we do have relationships with the Blackfeet Nation in terms of projects where we've been working on together with them and with the Navajo Nation and the Indian, uh, what, um, a group called Inca, the Indian Nation Conservation Alli Alliance, Conservation, I think it's Alliance, could be Association. Um, it's that, which is basically the, um, the group, the, the, Co the national coordination body for um, Indian nations, tr um, tribal co like uh, soil and water conservation districts. So like every, most counties in the United States have a soil and what a soil and water or natural resources, or they have lots of different names, conservation district, which is a money trickles down, but it's dedicated to protecting the natural resources of the place so that they can be sustainably used. And in tribal nations have those same bodies and then they have this national organization that collect, connects them. We've worked with them a lot um, to try to mobilize resources for ILM based mostly um, in the West riparian restoration um, and uh, um, like irrigation infrastructure modernization projects. So um, that's a great question. We want to do more. It is challenging um, in a lot of ways and for a lot of ways, but we've we've got some exciting things happening. I can talk more about when we have more time. All right, thanks. And thanks for doing hey, this. Fabulous. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I just, like I think people did some <laughs> hands. A little round of applause. Thank you Lewis. very much for having me. I'm like really, really excited as I like about everything that EcoAg and Thousand Landscapes continues to do. It's just really um, heartening to see how much the team has grown and how engaged you are with all of these other organizations and around the world. And it's just really cool. So um, yeah, thanks for having me back and let's continue to deepen uh, engagement together. Yes, okay. Yeah, Thank definitely. you, Lewis. That was nice final words. Um, and I also wanted to give just a quick shout out and thanks to Philip and Michael Brown for joining. Um, that was no it's awesome. Hopefully, hopefully you found this useful. I'm happy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's been quite exciting to listen to the story of uh, LM in the United States context, which is not what we deal with on a daily basis in a, in one thousand L. It's very very interesting to get that perspective as well. Thank you. Yay. Okay, well, thank you, Lewis. Thank you for everyone's attention. Um, we will all be in touch. I will connect dots with people who need to be connected. I know, Lewis, we had talked about doing a meeting of the brains of WLA mm -hmm. and Eco Egg, so we'll make that happen. Um, but yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a Ooh. great rest of your day, and we'll see you again. See you soon. Yeah, let me, stranger, reach out. You need anything? Uh, questions? Bye. Bye, bye. bye everyone.